I shall not pretend to consider it any matter for wonder that the extraordinary case of Monsieur Valdemar has excited discussion. It would have been a miracle had it not, especially under the circumstances. It is now rendered necessary that I give the facts, as far as I comprehend them myself. They are succinctly these. Uh, my attention uh, for the last three years had been repeatedly drawn to the subject of mesmerism. And about nine months ago, it occurred to me quite suddenly that in the series of experiments made hitherto, there had been a very remarkable and most unaccountable omission. No person had as yet been mesmerized in articulo mortis. It remained to be seen first whether in such condition there existed in the patient any susceptibility to the magnetic influence. Secondly, whether, if any existed, it was impaired or increased by the condition. Thirdly, to what extent or for how long a period the encroachments of death might be arrested by the process. In looking around me for some subject by whose means I might test these particulars, I was brought to think of my friend Monsieur Ernest Valdemar, the well-known compiler of the Bibliotheca Forensica, and author under the nom de plume of Isaac Marx, of the Polish versions of Wallenstein and Gargantua. Uh, Monsieur Valdemar, who has resided principally at Harlem, New York, since the year 1839, is, or was, uh, particularly noticeable for the extreme spareness of his person. His lower limbs much resembling those of John Randolph, and also for the whiteness of his whiskers, in violent contrast to the blackness of his hair, the latter in consequence being very generally mistaken for a wig. His temperament was markedly nervous and rendered him a good subject for mesmeric experiment. On two or three occasions I put him to sleep with little difficulty, but was disappointed in other results uh, which his peculiar constitution had naturally led me to anticipate. His will was at no period positively or thoroughly under my control. I always attributed my failure at these points to the disordered state of his health. For some months previous to my becoming acquainted with him, his physicians had declared him in a confirmed tisis. It was his custom, indeed, to speak calmly of his approaching dissolution, as of a matter neither to be avoided nor regretted. When the ideas to which I have alluded first occurred to me, it was, of course, very natural that I should think of Monsieur Valdemar. I knew the steady philosophy of the man too well to apprehend any scruples from him. And he had no relatives in America who would be likely to interfere. I spoke to him frankly upon the subject, and to my surprise, his interest seemed vividly excited. I say to my surprise, for although he had always yielded his person freely to my experiments, he had never before given me any tokens of sympathy with what I did. His disease was of that character which would admit of exact calculation in respect to the epoch of its termination in death, and it was finally arranged between us that he would send for me about 24 hours before the period announced by his physicians as that of his decease. It is now rather more than seven months since I received from M. Valdemar himself the subjoined note. My dear P., you may as well come now, D and F are agreed, that I can't hold up beyond tomorrow midnight, and I think they have hit the time very nearly. Valdemar. I received this note within half an hour after it was written, and in fifteen minutes more I was in the dying man's chamber. I had not seen him for ten days, and was appalled by the fearful alteration which the brief interval had wrought in him. His face wore a leaden hue, the eyes were utterly lusterless and the emaciation was so extreme that the skin had been broken through by the cheekbones. Doctors D and F were in attendance. After pressing Valdemar's hand, I took these gentlemen aside and obtained from them my new account of the patient's condition. The left lung had been for 18 months in a semi-osseous or cartilaginous state, and was, of course, entirely useless for all purposes of vitality. The right in its upper portion was also partially, if not thoroughly, ossified, while the lower region was merely a mass of purulent tubercles, running one into another. It was the opinion of both physicians that M. Valdemar would die about midnight on the morrow, Sunday. It was then about seven o'clock on Saturday evening. When they'd gone, I spoke freely with M. Valdemar on the subject of his approaching dissolution, as well as, uh, more particularly, 
of the experiment proposed. It wanted about five minutes of eight when, taking the patient's hand, I begged him to state as distinctly as he could whether he was entirely willing that I should make the experiment of mesmerizing him in his then condition. He replied feebly, yet quite audibly, Yes, I wish to be mesmerized. I fear you have deferred it too long. While he spoke thus, I commenced the passes, which I had already found most effectual in subduing him. He was evidently influenced with the first lateral stroke of my hand across his forehead. But although I exerted all my powers, no further perceptible effect was induced until some minutes after ten o'clock, when doctors D and F called according to appointment. I explained to them in a few words what I designed, and as they opposed my objection, saying that the patient was already in the death agony, I proceeded without hesitation. Exchanging, however, the lateral passes for downward ones and directing my gaze entirely into the right eye of the sufferer. By this time his pulse was imperceptible and his breathing was stertorous, and at intervals of half a minute. The patient's extremities were of an icy coldness. At five minutes before eleven, I perceived unequivocal signs of mesmeric influence. The glassy roll of the eye was changed with that expression of uneasy inward examination, which is never seen except in cases of sleep-waking. With a few rapid lateral passes, I made the lids quiver, as in incipient sleep, and with a few more, I closed them altogether. I was not satisfied, however, with this, but continued the manipulations vigorously, and with the fullest exertion of the will, until I had completely stiffened the limbs of the slumberer, after placing them in a seemingly easy position. When I had accomplished this, it was fully midnight, and I requested the gentleman present to examine Monsieur Valdemar's condition. The pulse was imperceptible. The breathing was gentle, scarcely noticeable, unless through the application of a mirror to the lips. The eyes were closed naturally, and the limbs were as rigid and as cold as marble. Still, the general appearance was certainly not that of death. As I approached Monsieur Valdemar, I made a kind of half-effort to influence his right arm into pursuit of my own, as I passed the latter gently to and fro above his person. In such experiments with this patient, I had never perfectly succeeded before, and assuredly I had little thought of succeeding now. But to my astonishment, his arm very readily, although feebly, followed every direction I assigned it with mine. I determined to hazard a few words of conversation. Monsieur Valdemar, I said, you asleep? He made no answer, but I perceived a tremor about his lips, and was thus induced to repeat the question again and again. At the third repetition, his whole frame was agitated by a very slight shivering. The eyelids unclosed themselves so far as to display a white line of a ball. The lips moved sluggishly, and from between them, in a barely audible whisper, issued the words, Yes, asleep now. Do not wake me. Let me die so. It was now the opinion, or rather the wish of the physicians, that Monsieur Valdemar should be suffered to remain undisturbed in his present apparently tranquil condition until death should supervene. And this, it was generally agreed, must now take place within a few minutes. I concluded, however, to speak to him once more, and merely repeated my previous question. While I spoke, there came a marked change over the countenance of the sleep-waker. The eyes rolled themselves slowly open, the pupils disappearing upwardly. The skin generally assumed a cadaverous hue, resembling not so much parchment as white paper and the circular hectic spots which hitherto had been strongly defined in the center of each cheek went out at once. I use this expression because the suddenness of their departure put me in mind of nothing so much as the extinguishment of a candle by a puff of breath. 
The upper lip at the same time writhed itself away from the teeth, which it had previously covered completely, while the lower jaw fell with an audible jerk, leaving the mouth widely extended and disclosing a full view of the swollen and blackened tongue. I presume the due member of the party then present had been unaccustomed to deathbed horrors, but so hideous beyond conception was the appearance of Monsieur Valdemar at this moment that there was a general shrinking back from the region of the bed. I now feel that I have reached a point in this narrative at which every reader will be startled into positive disbelief. It is my business, however, simply to proceed. There was no longer the faintest sign of vitality in Monsieur Valdemar, and concluding him to be dead, we were consigning him to the charge of the nurses when a strong vibratory motion was observable in the tongue. This continued for perhaps a minute. At the expiration of this period, there issued from the distended and motionless jaws a voice, such as it would be madness in me to attempt describing. Monsieur Valdemar spoke, obviously in reply to a question I had propounded to him a few minutes before. I had asked him, it will be remembered, if he still slept. He now said, No, I have been sleeping, and now, now, I am dead. No person present even affected to deny or attempt to repress the unutterable shuddering horror which these few words thus uttered were so well calculated to convey. The nurses immediately left the chamber and could not be induced to return. My own impressions I would not pretend to render intelligible to the reader without the utterance of a word. We addressed ourselves again to an investigation of Monsieur Valdemar's condition. It remained in all respects, as I have last described it, with the exception that the mirror no longer afforded evidence of respiration. An attempt to draw blood from the arm failed. The only real indication of the mesmeric influence was now found in the vibratory motion of the tongue whenever I addressed Monsieur Valdemar's question. He seemed to be making an effort to reply, but had no longer sufficient volition. I believe that I have now related all that is necessary to an understanding of the sleepwaker's state at this epoch. It was evident that so far death, or what is usually termed death, had been arrested by the mesmeric process. It seemed clear to us all that to awaken Monsieur Valdemar would be merely to ensure his instant, or at least his speedy, dissolution. From this period until the close of last week, an interval of nearly seven months, we continued to make daily calls at Monsieur Valdemar's house, accompanied now and then by medical or other friends. All this time, the sleep waker remained exactly as I have last described him. The nurse's attentions were continual. It was on Friday last that we finally resolved to make the experiment of awakening or attempting to awaken him. And it is the perhaps unfortunate result of this latter experiment which has given rise to so much discussion in private circles, to so much of what I cannot help thinking unwarranted popular feeling. For the purpose of relieving Monsieur Valdemar from mesmeric trance, I made use of the customary passes. These, for a time, were unsuccessful. The first indication of revival was afforded by a partial descent of the iris. It was observed, as especially remarkable, that this lowering of the pupil was accompanied by the profuse outflowing of a yellowish ichor from beneath the lids, of a pungent and highly offensive odor. Dr. F. then intimated a desire to have me put a question. I did so as follows. Monsieur Valdemar, can you explain to us what are your feelings or wishes now? There was an instant return of the hectic circles on the cheeks. The tongue quivered, or rather rolled violently in the mouth. 
although the jaws and lips remained rigid as before. And at length, the same hideous voice which I've already described broke forth. Oh, God, sake, quick, quick, put me to sleep. Oh, quick, awaken me, quick. I tell you, you, that I am dead, 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 dead. I was thoroughly unnerved, and for an instant remained undecided what to do. At first I made an effort to recompose the patient, but failing in this, through total abeyance of the will, I retracted my steps and as earnestly struggled to awaken him. In this attempt I soon saw that I should be successful, or at least I soon fancied that my success would be complete, and I am sure that all in the room were prepared to see the patient awaken. For what really occurred, however, it is quite impossible that any human being could have been prepared. As I rapidly made the mesmeric passes, amid ejaculations of dead, dead, absolutely bursting from the tongue and not from the lips of the sufferer, his whole frame at once shrunk, crumbled, absolutely rotted away beneath my hands. Upon the bed before the whole company, there lay a nearly liquid mass of loathsome, of detestable putrescence. that so far death, or what is usually termed death, had been arrested by the mesmeric process. It seemed clear to us all that to awaken Monsieur Valdemar would be merely to ensure his instant, or at least his speedy, dissolution. From this period until the close of last week, an interval of nearly seven months, we continued to make daily calls at Monsieur Valdemar's house, accompanied now and then by medical or other friends. All this time, the sleep waker remained exactly as I have last described him. The nurse's attentions were continual. It was on Friday last that we finally resolved to make the experiment of awakening or attempting to awaken him. And it is the perhaps unfortunate result of this latter experiment which has given rise to so much discussion in private circles, to so much of what I cannot help thinking unwarranted popular feeling. For the purpose of relieving Monsieur Valdemar from mesmeric trance, I made use of the customary passes. These, for a time, were unsuccessful. The first indication of revival was afforded by a partial descent of the iris. It was observed, as especially remarkable, that this lowering of the pupil was accompanied by the profuse outflowing of a yellowish ichor from beneath the lids of a pungent and highly offensive odour. Dr. F. then intimated a desire to have me put a question. I did so as follows. Monsieur Valdemar, can you explain to us what are your feelings or wishes now? There was an instant return of the hectic circles on the cheeks. The tongue quivered or rather rolled violently in the mouth, although the jaws and lips remained rigid as before, and at length the same hideous voice which I've already described broke forth. Oh, God, quick, 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 put me to sleep. Oh, quick, awaken me, quick. I tell you, you, that I am dead, 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 dead. Was thoroughly unnerved, and for an instant remained undecided what to do. At first, I made an effort to recompose the patient, but failing in this, through total abeyance of the will, I retracted my steps and as earnestly struggled to awaken him. In this attempt, I soon saw that I should be successful, or at least I soon fancied that my success would be complete, and I am sure that all in the room were prepared to see the patient awaken. Things I would not pretend to render intelligible to the reader. Without the utterance of a word, we addressed ourselves again to an investigation of Monsieur Valdemar's condition. It remained in all respects, as I have last described it, with the exception that the mirror no longer afforded evidence of respiration. An attempt to draw blood from the arm failed. The only real indication of the mesmeric influence was now found in the vibratory motion of the tongue, 
whenever I addressed Monsieur Valdemar a question. He seemed to be making an effort to reply, but had no longer sufficient volition. I believe that I have now related all that is necessary to an understanding of the sleepwaker's state at this epoch. It was evident that so far death, or what is usually termed death, had been arrested by the mesmeric process. It seemed clear to us all that to awaken Monsieur Valdemar would be merely to ensure his instant, or at least his speedy, dissolution. From this period until the close of last week, an interval of nearly seven months, we continued to make daily calls at Monsieur Valdemar's house, accompanied now and then by medical or other friends. All this time, the sleep waker remained exactly as I have last described him. The nurse's attentions were continual. It was on Friday last that we finally resolved to make the experiment of awakening or attempting to awaken him. And it is the perhaps unfortunate result of this latter experiment which has given rise to so much discussion in private circles, to so much of what I cannot help thinking unwarranted popular feeling. For the purpose of relieving Monsieur Valdemar from mesmeric trance, I made use of the customary passes. These, for a time, were unsuccessful. The first indication of revival was afforded by a partial descent of the iris. It was observed, as especially remarkable, that this lowering of the pupil was accompanied by the profuse outflowing of a yellowish ichor from beneath the lids, of a pungent and highly offensive odour. Dr. F. then intimated a desire to have me put a question. I did so as follows. Monsieur Valdemar, can you explain to us what are your feelings or wishes now? There was an instant return of the hectic circles on the cheeks. The tongue quivered, or rather rolled violently in the mouth, although the jaws and lips remained rigid as before, and at length the same hideous voice which I've already described broke forth. Oh, God, go ahead. Address Monsieur Valdemar a question. He seemed to be making an effort to reply, but had no longer sufficient volition. I believe that I have now related all that is necessary to an understanding of the sleepwaker's state at this epoch. It was evident that so far death, or what is usually termed death, had been arrested by the mesmeric process. It seemed clear to us all that to awaken Monsieur Valdemar would be merely to ensure his instant, or at least his speedy, dissolution. From this period until the close of last week, an interval of nearly seven months, we continued to make daily calls at Monsieur Valdemar's house, accompanied now and then by medical or other friends. All this time, the sleep waker remained exactly as I have last described him. The nurse's attentions were continual. It was on Friday last that we finally resolved to make the experiment of awakening or attempting to awaken him. And it is the perhaps unfortunate result of this latter experiment which has given rise to so much discussion in private circles, to so much of what I cannot help thinking unwarranted popular feeling. For the purpose of relieving Monsieur Valdemar from mesmeric trance, I made use of the customary passes. These, for a time, were unsuccessful. The first indication of revival was afforded by a partial descent of the iris. It was observed, as especially remarkable, that this lowering of the pupil was accompanied by the profuse outflowing of a yellowish ichor from beneath the lids, of a pungent and highly offensive odour. Dr. F., then intimated a desire to have me put a question. I did so as follows. Monsieur Valdemar, can you explain to us what are your feelings or wishes now? There was an instant return of the hectic circles on the cheeks. The tongue quivered, or rather rolled violently in the mouth, although the jaws and lips remained rigid as before 
and at length the same hideous voice which I've already described broke forth. Oh, God, sleep, quick, quick, put me to sleep, oh, quick, awaken me, quick, I tell you, you, I am dead, 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 dead. I was thoroughly unnerved, and for an instant remained undecided what to do. At first I made an endeavor to recompose the patient. But failing in this, it has raised. I fear you have deferred it too long. While he spoke thus, I commenced the passes, which I had already found most effectual in subduing him. He was evidently influenced with the first lateral stroke of my hand across his forehead. But although I exerted all my powers, no further perceptible effect was induced until some minutes after ten o'clock when doctors D and F called according to appointment. I explained to them in a few words what I designed, and as they opposed no objection, saying that the patient was already in the death agony, I proceeded without hesitation, exchanging, however, the lateral passes for downward ones and directing my gaze entirely into the right eye of the sufferer. By this time his pulse was imperceptible and his breathing was stertorous, and at intervals of half a minute. The patient's extremities were of an icy coldness. At five minutes before eleven, I perceived unequivocal signs of mesmeric influence. The glassy roll of the eye was changed with that expression of uneasy inward examination, which is never seen except in cases of sleep-waking. With a few rapid lateral passes, I made the lids quiver, as in incipient sleep, and with a few more, I closed them altogether. I was not satisfied, however, with this, but continued the manipulations vigorously and with the fullest exertion of the will until I had completely stiffened the limbs of the slumberer after placing them in a seemingly easy position. When I had accomplished this, it was fully midnight, and I requested the gentleman present to examine Monsieur Valdemar's condition. The pulse was imperceptible. The breathing was gentle, scarcely noticeable, unless through the application of a mirror to the lips. The eyes were closed naturally, and the limbs were as rigid and as cold as marble. Still, the general appearance was certainly not that of death. As I approached Monsieur Valdemar, I made a kind of half-effort to influence his right arm into pursuit of my own, as I passed the latter gently to and fro above his person. In such experiments with this patient, I had never perfectly succeeded before, and assuredly I had little thought of succeeding now. But to my astonishment, his arm very readily, although feebly, followed every direction I assigned it with mine. I determined to hazard a few words of conversation. Monsieur Valdemar, I said, you asleep? He made no answer, but I perceived a tremor about his lips, and was thus induced to repeat the question again and again. <laughs>